Hello everyone, my name is Mix. Um, we're going to be looking at the terminal for the next half hour. No. Um, so I work on a project called Scuttlebutt. Um, it's been around for about five years and it's from New Zealand originally. Um, I'm going to structure this talk a little bit like Scuttlebutt structured, which is quite messily. Um, there's these sort of rough areas that I thought I might pass through or explore and given the size of the group I think what I'll do is like a quick first pass through some of those and then see what you'd like to hear more about. So it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. So um, I'll start um, here just for somewhere to start. Um, so from experience, describing Scuttlebutt can be a little bit tricky because it's a community as well as a software project, um, which is a bunch of its success. Um, here's a summary of our principles stack, which is, it kind of blends, um, I guess, political perspectives and beliefs with code um, beliefs. So an example of that would be um, local first. There's an observation that um, Global databases and global forums are really great for some things, but they're also really not great for some things, like listening to strangers. Um, and perhaps it would be good to build things which are for communicating with people who you know. Um, and local first also means let's build things so that they work offline, so that they're super resilient, work in locations without the internet. Um, yeah. And some other things. Um, independence and interdependence are two other favourites of mine. Um, interdependence means let's work together, let's collaborate on things. Independence means you can't tell me what to do. Um, as in, I shouldn't necessarily be bound to having to collaborate with some people if I want to like publish things in different formats. And by having both of these values at the same time, um, we have like quite a lot of resilience and dynamism. Um, I'll come back to this if people want to ask any more questions about it. Um, I want to talk about some of the current projects. Uh, so here's one of the projects. This is a, um, so what is Scuttlebutt? Scuttlebutt is a peer-to-peer -peer database. Uh, it lets anyone publish any sort of shape of message they want. What I mean by that is like, if I wanted, if I wanted to publish a message of type bip with text boom, that um, I don't know what that means, but now it exists in the network. And Zach could see it and be like, ah, that means pizza's on, or whatever. And that can be, um, y you can also read that. Um, um, so on top of that basic, anyone can publish anything and everything has a unique um, identifier, like a key you can reference. We've built all sorts of applications. Um, many of the applications let you publish post type messages. It's just like some text with some markdown and an image if you want. This is some people in Auckland who bought, um, noticed an abandoned boat in the harbour and then commandeered it. No, they didn't. Um, they they did climb aboard and explore it, but then they found the owner, um, did some sleuthing around, and then um, bought it collectively as um, a community effort. So that's this is one of the applications. There's another one. This is private messages. These are encrypted messages between me and my friends. Don't want to leave it on the screen too long. Um, this is an implementation of chess. Um, so interesting side effect is like a lot of people enjoy uh, talking out in the open and having big group conversations and then there's like a whole cohort of people who do nothing but communicate via chess. So you can have private chat alongside your chess game and it's a really cozy, nice environment. Or you could just play chess and not talk. Um, what else? Um, I built a calendar. Um, I can see what events are going on in November. Um, these are things from around the world, from people who I follow, so I, I have their data if I follow them. So here's um, Art Hack, 
which is happening over at Dev Academy um, in November, earlier this month. Yeah, so um, so this is one project, it's a client. Um, so there's the database level where information moves around. This is a particular client which has opinions about how to display things. Um, there are other such clients because not everyone wants to navigate things in the same way. So here's an example, here's patchwork. It looks very similar. Uh, sorry, I can't make that bigger right now. Um, has many of the same features. There's patch bay, we've already looked at that. Oh yeah, there's like a book review system as well, like Goodreads. Um, there's a mobile client called Miniverse. There's another one coming out called um, Planetary for iPhone. This is like the, I don't know how to best characterize patch foo. This is for um, people who don't like JavaScript um, <laughs> and really like quite minimal interfaces. I've, I don't know how to use it. Um, but it appeals to a whole, a whole range of people. I don't, yeah, I don't understand that completely. There's like um, a version which is built um, using just a um, Mozilla extensions. So the front end just runs in, in, in Firefox. Um, and here's the current app that I'm working on. It's a um, traditional knowledge management system. So we're looking at tracing Whakapapa. This is like very, very beta app at the moment, but um, looking at being able to... Oh, this is a new feature. I was just reviewing this this afternoon. So yeah, you'll be able to, this is exciting. Um, yep, ideally you'll be able to enter some information, publish that. Um, and this is all local, works offline. Um, only people who I have connected with and trust can read it. Um, but also people who you don't trust can also replicate it and be um, kind of custodians of that knowledge even if they can't read it. Okay, so that's like an overview of some of the projects. Oh, there's like other things like um, a version of Git and NPM also built on top of this system. Uh, so that's current projects. We've dipped into the technology a little bit. Um, hands up if you know what a hash is. Okay, like a hash is a unique signature um, for something. So you can, you take the content of your message, perform some function on it, and then you get this unique ID here. This is just the hash. And so we use that for um, content addressing things. We can just, as long as you know that, you don't need to know where the data exists, you can just summon it from the ether or from your friend network in this case. So we use hashing for addressing. We have signatures, which are cryptographic signatures. So um, my identity is based on a key pair. I sign the messages with that. People can then, because it's a public private key pair, people can verify that it was me that wrote it, even if it came from Zach. So that's like a pretty crucial affordance in a peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, and I think the final piece of technology is like an append-only log. As in, once something is published on the system, you can't take it back. Um, I can go into the reasons why and, and then how you build things in that environment if people are interested. Um, the the final domain I wanted to talk about was the community. So this is, there are people from, there's about, I think there's about 10,000 accounts currently um, registered that I've seen on Scuttlebutt. Doesn't mean I've seen them all. But yeah, there's about 10,000. Um, there are probably like at most 50 developers who are like actively building things on this. Uh, and they're based in, all, kind, all sorts of countries, there's, there's people in um, Hamburg and um, a couple of European countries, there's like, yeah, France and not Brussels, but I've forgotten the name of it. Um, there's someone in South Africa <coughs> building things, there's someone in Australia, people in North America, um, Brazil, and we're collaborating with some people in Namibia at the moment. So the community is um, incredibly friendly. Uh, earlier this year I organized a camp in, outside of Wellington in Otaki and about 50 people came from around the world. I had like sponsorship from a company that's 
in Silicon Valley, they put about $20,000 towards paying for people's flights to come, flights to come out. Um, that was super delightful. The, so this was our like version of a conference and the focus um, wasn't really giving talks, it was more just like hanging out because, so I, yeah, I was involved in organizing it and my belief is that if you hang out with people, then you can solve difficult problems. So yeah, we talked about technical stuff, but we also like just hung around and um, shared meals and stuff. Um, yeah, and through that we um, yeah, got to do things like diversity and inclusion work, which is like, who do we want to be building this open source project? Whose voices do we want to be present? Um, so some of the money from, from that company was channeled into this, but we also had like um, people give about like $5,000 towards um, scholarships, so we're able to like pay for people to attend who wouldn't otherwise have been able to. And personally, that, that journey's been like really rewarding um, for me and I think for the community. Um, it means we've got more queer people, more artists, more different voices, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm gonna pause there and um, take some questions which might help direct where you might like more information. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so building in this way, you can't, you don't get to validate data as it goes into the database because the database could be over there. The, as in like my friend wrote it I, with their weird client called Patchville or something. So um, it can totally come through weird. And that means that the onus is on the reader who's interpreting the data that they've received to make sense of the data that they've received and you, you have choices. There's one which is like, this is a bit weird, but I can kind of munge it into the format that I think I can make sense of this. Or, um, and I'm, I'm leaning more towards um, like a, a much more brutal thing, which is like I build a JSON schema. If your thing gets through the filter, I know how to deal with it and it's easy, but otherwise I'm just gonna ignore it. Um, so this is that like um, independence, interdependence tension which is like, if there's a critical number of people, it's, it's actually very like um, human language. If a critical number of people use the word munge, even if it's not like a very common word now, then you, we can start to agree what the protocol is around that. And you might be forced to, because if everyone but you is using it, then it's kind of a de facto standard or a specification. Um, whether you wanna build an app which uh, serves munging, whatever that is, um, is totally up to you. Like, you can ignore chess. You have chess, me I have chess messages on my computer that mostly I ignore, because they're not my games of chess, or uh, I don't want to play chess right now, but I'm supporting them moving around. No, you didn't. I I skipped over that. Um, so. Um, so there's there's two main ways that things move around at the moment, um, and there's hopes for different ways in the future. The easiest, nice scenario is I have my laptop here. Zach has his laptop just sitting next to me, and we're connected to the same Wi-Fi some like access point. So we're on the same local area network. Um, my laptop sends out a UDP, hello, I'm over here. Um, Zach hears it and then he just dials directly to my IP address. Um, there's a secret handshake that happens to ensure that we are not pretending to be who we are, like prove who you are using your secret keys. 
And then you um, and then you just like have a goss, like, hey Zach, have you heard from Dominic recently? And he's like, Dominic, yeah, I heard something from him um, five minutes ago. Actually, here's the latest goss. Um, scuttlebutt, by the way, is short for gossip. Um, is C um, seafaring slang for gossip. Um, it was made by a sailor, the software. Um, yeah, so th that's one way, is uh, local gossip when you're on the same Wi-Fi. It's quite delightful. Um, in this way, you can run something. You, you don't need the, just to clarify, this, is, this doesn't need to be connected to the internet at all. Um, Wi-Fi doesn't equal like connection to the internet. So this is how we're doing, um, this is like sneaker net mode. You can run it like this. Sneaker net as in it's a network based on people moving data around using their sneakers. Um, and this is how we're running a, um, a messaging system with some people in Namibia at the moment. These, these two things are phones. We set up a hotspot. This person has recorded a, a, an audio message. They maybe want to share a, a story from their village or an invitation to an event that's coming up. And then somebody uh, walks the phone. In this case, actually, there's a third, there's a third party that's like a ranger and they're driving around with their phone. It gossips, they move over here and then it gossips with that other one and then the message is delivered. Um, yep, so that's local. Uh, and then the, the other way we have things set up at the moment is um, we have um, devices which are just another peer sitting on the internet which has a public IP address which is known and it's static. And in that way, um, I can connect to that place and share gossip. So I could ask, hey, robot on the internet, have you heard of anything from Zach or from Grant or whatever? And then later, and then I disconnect. So it gets some new information. Later, Zach connects and says, hey, have you heard anything from Mix or from Grant? And it says, yep and they do a swap. So um, this thing, this pattern we has had like a couple of names. Sometimes it's called pub, like it's like a pub you could swing by or a public pier. Um, another name we've been exploring recently is like Pataka. It's like a storehouse or like a somewhere that you would keep your taonga. Um, and it's like a, it's a place that nourishes the community. Uh, I'm kind of leaning towards that now. Yeah. Okay. We have learned some. <coughs> Does it remember it forever? Yeah. Could it, could it just forget things? It could, for example, this space in which it's. Yeah, it could. Um, so at the moment, the, the log files just stores raw data, and you could, you could like, make a copy of that and say, throw out any of the accounts that haven't been active for the last year. And then, so you could take a, a 600 gigabyte file and then trim it down to 300 by throwing out accounts, for example. Um, it really depends how you build things. Like one way that you could build things, which is being explored at the moment for like deletable content purposes, is that one of the things that you could do is um, rather than storing the text content directly in the message, which is hashed and sort of bound in there, you can store it in a blob, which also has a hash. So like just in a, a file that's referenced. So the um, each user has a feed of messages. This is message number one. And then I post a second message and it links back to message number two. And each of these is linking back. And so this is a big hash chain. So it's like a blockchain, but with other blocks. And no consensus. So it's just a chain. <laughs> um, and you can't delete content out of these because it's how you verify that it wasn't someone who stole the key and is pretending to be me. Um, is there's this big long history as like one of the properties. But you can reference um, like a file out here to the side, which also has a hash. Um, and that's how images and stuff are passed around. So 
the message content like this has the the chain of hashes is very like Git. That's how Git references its commits, that's true. Um, but with editing in particular, it gets quite complicated. It gets quite Git like, um, like a Git branch merge conflict type thing because say um, Grant organizes an event, I edit the date, Zach also edits the date. What do you want to do with that information? You can um, say, well, there are now two definitions of what the date could be and turn up on both dates. Um, or it could be that you have another another sort of message, which is like a merge message, where so Grant comes back and goes, thanks everyone for noticing that. I'm gonna like acknowledge that these two things happened and I'm gonna merge the, merge the state, resolve the conflict, and the date was actually the 21st of November. So uh, you can build quite complicated application level logic using these basic primitives, but it starts to get, it can get a little bit tricky. What does a chest look like? Down the wire. Down the wire, like what does it look, what does a chest message look like? Yeah. Um, what's the, sorry, there's two options. One of them is like slowly search for one. I know, the guy who, um, made chess is this guy in Scotland. Uh, and he plays a lot of chess. Oop. <coughs> so here's a chess move. It's of type. Sorry, I'll make it bigger. Wee, 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 wee. It's of type chess move. Root, this is like a common convention. Again, it's not like programmatic, but this, this is like, this is the start of the game. This is where it started. And <coughs> branches like here's the previous move so you can start to build up a story if you want um, and here's the he's he's um, using some application which like encodes board states really densely so it's not really nice to look at but yeah I can look at I can if I click on this message then it route this takes me to a view which knows how to interpret that whole chain of messages so this this particular chain will be made up of like his moves and other moves that other people are making, and they'll be referencing each other's message back and forth. Any other questions? So are the messages encrypted? Um, so they're cryptographically signed, right. and then there are some messages which are, let's see if I can find one. And then you can also have messages which are encrypted on top of that. So here's an example of, these are examples of messages with the lock next to them which were encrypted, but I, they were sent to me so I can read them. I'm trying to find, here's one. Here's a message, the content is completely opaque to me. Um, one interesting, one interesting decision that has been made with the system is that um, the there's no to field on this message. Unlike like a PGP encrypted email where you see who it's going to, this has no none of that metadata. It's just encrypted. And so, to figure out if this was f for you, you try your keys on it to see if you can open it, and if you could open it, it was for you. It's kind of like you found a note on a park bench, except. Um, you're only picking up notes that were written by people you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, uh, the like rep what you choose to replicate is up to you. You have to know people's public keys to be able to ask. So you can't just be like, "Give me everything you've got." I think. I think you have to say, um, I would like updates from f Alice, Bob, Alana, you know, like name people by their public keys. And um, you, the, the way we, um, sorry, I'm just bringing up a visual thing. We have um, 
kind of like a, you know, um, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? Do you know that thing? It's like, um, at most you're probably six degrees of friendship away from reaching Kevin Bacon if you should so wish. So you could probably talk to your mum who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who is Kevin Bacon. Um, <coughs> New Zealand's quite small. We have like about two degrees of separation here, hence the, hence the telecom company, I think. Um, and so we've, we've got a default set for this network as well, which is like you replicate out to two degrees of separation. So this here, this is me. This here could be Zach. This is Zach's um, father-in-law, who I don't know, but he's relevant to Zach, so he's kind of relevant to me in the same way that like if you... So it's useful to when Zach talks, if he references someone, if I know who he was, to, who he was talking about. Um, so by default, we, you don't replicate everything that you find. You declare who you want to follow, kind of like Twitter, and then you get them plus their followers. And if, you, if you're not really that um, gregarious, you just want people who you follow, you can change a setting and just be like, just give me the people I follow. Um, or you can be like super gre gregarious and be like, just give me all the things like, Yeah, so this is a client interface that I built which changes the setting low down so that when you start up, it knows how far to follow out, how far out to follow and replicate. So, uh, what's the system pipe run on your engine? Uh, what storage engine does it use? What storage engine? Yeah, it's basically. Yeah, so it uses a custom database. Um, it looks like it's just a file. The, so th there's, there's different layers of database. There's the, the raw log is just an append-only file, and it just shovels data into it. Um, that's not very useful. It's kind of like the equivalent of having a library where the order that the books are on the shelves are the order that you bought them or that they came into the library. It's a nightmare. Um, so, but the good, it, has, it does have some affordances. It means you don't, you can really quickly replicate into there because you can just dump heaps of stuff in. So if you meet a new person, you can just, you don't have to do any processing. Above that, we build um, material, like, they're called like materialized views, as in you build an index, you say, I would like to know where all the chess moves are, please. And you just scan across that whole file and write down where they were on the shelves. And then you can say, Give me all the chess moves by happy zero in Scotland. And it's just like, and knows where they are. So we have these indexes built on top of that. And th some of those are built in level DB. Some of them are built in SQL. It's really up to you what sort of view you want to be materializing or sense you want to be making from that mess of a library. Any other questions? Uh, yes, no. I would say more like, uh, like what I've personally found is that uh, diversity and inclusion work is all about building relationships. And so like cold calling someone who you don't know and being like, do you want a ticket? <laughs> is, is a bit, it doesn't really work because you don't know anything about their context. They don't know you. They don't know what sort of event they would be accepting an invitation into. Um, is this a safe place for me to go? These are just some random nerds who, yeah. And you also don't have the foundation of a relationship to be able to understand that, understand their needs and to be able to have some difficult conversations like, I actually can't come because I'm supporting a family member because the state abused my family because we're indigenous, et cetera, et cetera, something, something. Um, so in short, um, we invited people who were like one to two hops away from us. So I have a friend who has an Aboriginal friend in so-called Australia, and 
he was already building a relationship with that person and collaboration. And because of that, we were able to um, invite them to come and it was it felt good as opposed to just tokenistic or whatever. Oh, great question. Yeah. So we can't support movies very easily at the moment. Um, but yeah, so you can, yeah, you can. So this, what's most scary to me, if we want to go like straight to the d d super dangerous space, is like doxing people. Like if I find out your home address and I put it on here, you can't take it down. Like you can ask people, n the best you can do is point at someone and say, I think this is an abusive actor. I will no longer replicate that person. And if you're a friend of mine, I'd appreciate it if you didn't as well. But it's really up to other peers to decide. And so we do have some people who have, they haven't doxed people, but they've... Um, it can happen accidentally. It can happen accidentally, right? Yeah, because you can accidentally out someone and put some well, way that... Yeah, like I, I mentioned that uh, someone I knew had a child on here. You know, I said, how's your child or something? And they said, I'd rather not have that in the public domain because I'm quite a public figure and I don't want people threatening anyone. But um, yeah, so you can't take it back. All you can do is um, reduce the replication of a person, so reduce their reach. And you can only do that within your own sphere. Um, yeah. The another way is um, to, as I was saying before, to like change the content out for just a reference to the content, and then you can ask people to delete the content. So that's something that's being built at the moment and explored. Uh, it's still tricky because how do you how do you? I can't enforce that someone will have done it. I I don't I don't yet know of a way to force someone to prove that they deleted something. They could have always taken a copy or screenshotted it or something. All you can do is mitigate, I think. Yep. Great question. Yeah, you do have some pizza. So oh, yeah. People can keep chatting. Um, I'm happy to chat over pizza as well, so. Yeah.